I think God's happy right this moment. Um, he can hear you better than me. These are just for looks, but I could hear you. I could hear you singing to him. That was awesome. We have a really good band. I don't know who are these guys, right? That's just so good. Uh, and we don't have to pay them. It's like amazing. What a, what a, such a deal. Such a deal. Hey, we're going to, uh, let's hear from God, okay? And so we're going to continue on in our series called I Choose. And uh, it's based on a scripture verse. And anyone know which one that is? Anyone, 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 anyone? No one? Awesome. Romans 6, 16. Whatever, you, whatever I choose, we change it, right? We don't change God's word around here, but we make it personal, right? Whatever I choose to obey becomes my master. See, a lot of us are walking around thinking, that this thing owns me. I can't help it. Yeah, you can, right? You got more power than you think. It's God-given, right? We're nothing special. God's awesome. But in his sovereignty, as he's running his universe, there's some things in there that he said, okay, um, I'm in control, but I'm going to let you decide this. I'm going to let you do that. But just never forget that because you get to do it, that doesn't mean who rate you. It's because he lets you, okay? So he's still in control of all that. But whatever you choose to obey, we change it to whatever, what? I, right? Whatever I choose to obey becomes my master. Um, I use the New Living Translation. It's really good because it kind of gets the point across. Um, but if you go to uh, many other translations, older translations, kind of more of a word for word the, the, the NLT is awesome, but it talks really about who your master is. But if you go to like Holman Christian Standard Bible, uh, ESV, New American Standard, stuff like that, you're going to hear something more along the lines like this. Coming at it, same thing, different angle, okay? It's going to say this. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, doulos, doulos means one thing. Doesn't, you know, a lot of words have, uh, in Greek have like several American meanings. Okay, this word has only had one meaning <clears throat> ever, even today, and it means slave, right? It's not bonds. This is bond servant. That's, that's a made-up American version of something, to go light, okay? It's a slave, right? You know, like Peter and all those guys. I, Peter, I, Paul, a slave of Christ, right? That means, guess what? You gave up your rights. It's a voluntary slavery. I'm in. You own me. I belong to you, right? So don't you know that if you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, right? <clears throat> so we're going to dive deeper into that, right? This is a clear truth. It's clear truth. Everyone understands it. Maybe you don't live in it out yet. But the truth is you get to obey, you get to choose, right? So here's a cool story. So I'm like, I got the I choose thing on my mind, right? This is what, I, this is what we're going through. <clears throat> and so I'm thinking about it, and I'm, I'm talking about it. So the other day, uh, this was Tuesday. This is such a cool story, guys. You ready? So Tuesday, it's the only day of the week that the coffee house isn't open. And the reason is because we have a group, a government group called Devereaux Kids, and they, they use our space here to reunite families. So if there's, a, if there's parents that have um, gone through a really, really difficult situation and there's um, drug abuse, violence, anything like that, and the judge says, hey, take the kids and you need to go get better and get you ready to be a mom or a dad again and then we'll get you your kids back. So here's a parenting class you have to go take, right? So that's what we use. We, us, we use this place for them on Tuesday, we offer that place to them, which is a huge blessing. We don't charge them anything because we're all about, right, the, the gospel, yeah. right? And the gospel is what? Restoration, right? Reconciliation. So let's get these parents, get them right, get them back with their kids, right? They don't need to be in the system longer, right? Get them out of that, get them back with, the system, with, their, with their family. Okay, so here's the deal. So I'm sitting up front the other day. And, and we're closed, but I was making one of those fancy little coffees up there, and I wanted to make one for the instructor, just trying to be nice, friendly, right? And so <clears throat> she's sitting there talking to one of the young girls. There's, she's a student, right? She's one of, the, one of the, she's probably 24, 25 years old, right? And, and, and her kids are, 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 are not with her, and she has, she has to take the class, right? 
So she's, I, I'm sitting there, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm eavesdropping, right? I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm eavesdropping. I'm making a little coffee for the lady. And I hear them talking about something. And, I'll, and you know, I, got, I choose on my mind. So I like, boop, interject, right? Gospel opportunity. <clears throat> and she's talking about, she feels like she's controlled by these things. And I'm like, whoa, well, hold on a second. And she was talking about the cigarettes. She had a pack of 305s or something, 350s or 305s, sitting right there on the, on the table out there in front of her. And she's one that's out there every single time smoking before the class, right? And then the class is over, she's out there smoking again. And she's just talking about her weakness and how she can't seem to do this and she can't seem to do that. So I'm like, here's an opportunity, right? So on, on, on Wednesday night, we've been talking about, like, green apples, red apples. If it's ready, if it's red, right, that, they're red for the gospel. They are ready, right? So I'm thinking, man, this, this lady right here, she's ready to hear this I choose thing right now. So she's, she's talking about her weakness, how she, and then she starts talking about the smoking. And I interject, and I'm like, hey, uh, you know, you can put those things down right now and never pick them up again, you know? And she's like, oh, yeah? <laughs> right? I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I said, um, did you know that, um, oh, let me, let me ask you a question, ma'am. Are you a Christian? And she said, yeah. I said, um, so are you trying to tell me that um, that little piece of paper right there with those leaves in it has more power than you who has the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead? Mm-hmm. And she's like, boom. <laughs> right? I said, because the Bible that you say you believe says whatever I choose to obey becomes your master. And so I decided 15 years ago I was never going to have another drink, and I was never going to have another cigarette, because I drank every single night. I smoked at least a pack a day. And one day I just said, God, take this from me, and I'm never having one again, no matter what. Hell or high water, I'm not having one. And it's been 15 years I haven't had a drink or a cigarette, right? Right? So, but I'm nothing special. You're nothing special. No one's anything special. We're just people, Right? And, and so, and I haven't done it. And, and I could, I, I'm telling you, you could, you could put your heel on the head of those things right now. I don't even know her name. And she, and this was awesome. Right then, and she goes, thanks, I needed to hear that. She stood up, she walked over to that brown trash can, opened up, chucked her cigarettes in it. Wow. Right? Awesome, awesome, awesome. And so that's what we're looking for, Right? We're not looking for, for, for you to be here to hear an, another message of the, of the 15 years of me doing this so you can go, hey, nice message. No, what we're looking for is for you to open up the garbage can and chuck something in it, right? Every single time you come to church, you should be coming with, a, with this in mind. What can I obey? Now, what I can hear, what can I obey, right? <clears throat> I don't, you don't need another speech. You already know a ton of stuff, right? I could just close the book right now and say, hey, Here's the deal. Tonight, I want you to take something you already know, go home, do it. Come back next week. That'd be good enough, but that's not what you pay me for, and that's not what I've done this week. I've studied, and I want to pass a message on to you from <clears throat> God's word. Okay, so whatever I choose to obey becomes my master. I'm an obedient slave to this thing, and so guess what? It owns me. It owns me. This is clear and direct truth. But the question is, is it unique? Is this verse right here in Scripture, Romans 16, uh, 6, 16, is it unique? Is it a standalone Scripture? Like a lot of churches and denominations will take a Scripture, like one verse, and they'll pull it out, and they'll form an entire denomination or a doctrine around this thing, trying to get you to kind of do it this way. Is that true? In other words, another way to ask this is this. Does this, does the Bible support that verse with other verses. And so I want to offer a few to you because we're a Bible church, right? So how about this, Joshua 24, 15. Choose today whom you will serve, right? So there's that one. And then 1 Kings 18, 21, right? This is, these are, like, listen, Joshua was to God's people. This wasn't to the strangers. This wasn't to the pagans, right? Hey, figure out who you're going to serve today. No, he's talking to his people, talking to God's people, God talking to his own people. And again, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, Elijah the prophet, awesome Jewish prophet, right? And the Jewish people, man, they're worshiping God, and then they they get kind of sick of that, and that's just not working out the way I thought it would, so I'm going to worship this piano over here for a little while, and that looks kind of nice, and and that's not really working what I thought. So let me go back over here to to Yahweh, and I'll, I'll worship God for a little while until things fall through, because the God that I've created in my mind isn't the real God, so it fails me. And then I go back over here, well, let me see what else I can worship over here. So Elijah, one day because God's inspiring him to do so he looks at the people in 1821 he says how much longer will you waver hobbling back and forth back and forth back and forth between two opinions I love that too 
I love the word opinion. You know what, you know what he just did? You're small. <laughs> what you think doesn't even matter, right? I'm Lord, but you have an opinion, and you have to decide whether you're going to let me be your Lord. So he says, hobbling between two opinions. Real basic. I love this kind of preaching. I would have loved listening to Elijah. If the Lord is God, follow him. Boom, right? That's it. If he is God, and I know that everybody in this room, I think I know it pretty much everybody in here, in here, in here, in here, in here, in here, in here. Okay, you've all, I know you've all said that Jesus is Lord. So the question is, if he is, then follow him. Remember last week I said, if, if, all, if all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus, and he said, go do this, why haven't you? Right? He said, if the Lord is God, then follow him. He says this other thing, too. He says, hey, and if Baal is God, Baal is just one of these false gods, right? So anything, this pulpit, him, you, the camera, whatever it is that you're pretending with and playing and, 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 and cheating on God with, if that thing is God, then follow it. But make a decision, right? I choose. Isn't that just, just a choice, right? Choose today whom you will serve Make a decision. If this one's God, follow him. If this one's God, follow Whatever it is, just make a decision. You choose, right? Um, Isaiah, another pillar of the faith. In Isaiah 50, verse 7, he says this. Therefore, I have set my face like stone. Right? See the mountain? Unchanging, rocky mountains. They never change. You visit them now, they look a certain way. You come back 30 years from now, same spot, pitch your tent right there, rock looks exactly the same. Never changing, right? He said, I've set my face like stone, determined to do his will. Right? Who, 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 who decided to do that? Was it, was it God that decided to do that? or did Who did? He did. He decided, right? I chose this. This is what I've decided. I've, I've gathered all the information. He says, so therefore, right? So you know before that, he's gathered the information. He's done his research. He's seen what's going on. He says, so based on that, therefore, I have determined to set my face like stone. I'm just going to do this. I'm following after him. I made my choice, right? And that's what God wants you to do. Here's some more Romans 12, 2. Right? Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Did you hear that one word? Let. That's choice. But let God transform you into a new person by, ch by, by changing the way you think, right? You have to choose that. Let, imagine that, the sovereign king of the universe, the one who spoke Saturn's rings out of his mouth, and he said, you get to choose. You get to decide whether I'm going to really influence you or not. I'm right here. I'm king and God. You can hang out with me forever. I can give you an awesome experience with me forever, but that's your choice, Right? Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Galatians 5, 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us follow. Let, there it is again. <clears throat> not, not imposed upon you. Not once you're saved, that's exactly what you're going to do. No, why would he say it if it was, right? He said, let us follow him in every part of our lives, right? So verse after verse, and there's more, God's word clearly teaching us that God has given you and I the power, the ability to choose our master. Who or what gets to have authority in your life? Who do you live for? How are you going to live this life out? Say, I get to choose. Let's hear it. I get to choose. I get to choose. <clears throat> so let's take, another, let's take a look at another powerful choice that God says you get to make, right? He's not going to make it for you. Nobody can make it for you. you can't, Mama, you can't do it for your kids. They have to do it for themselves, right? Your preacher can't do it. Your president can't do it. Your mama, your daddy, your husband, your wife, no one can do it. But you can do it. You can make this choice, and it can dramatically impact your life. Are you ready for what, what it is? I choose to be thankful. I choose to be thankful. And I'm not really good at this, so I'm preaching God's word, not preaching my opinion or experience, okay? So I choose to be thankful, and I'm just not going to come up with something and say, oh, this is kind of cool. Let's get these people thankful. Maybe they'll give some more. No. It's got to come from the Bible, right? So there it is right there. Look in your Bible. Take a look at it. What does it say? It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that the preacher can only make this claim if it says it in my word. That's what it says. He says, be, that's a choice, right? Not you are. He said, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. 
Last week we made, and the week before, we're making these decisions. I choose Jesus, remember? I choose Jesus. So, so have you made the choice for Jesus yet? Right? Do you do loss? Do you belong to Jesus? Are you owned, bought at a price? Are you his, this is hard, are you his slave? Are you his slave? Okay, so if, if you're his slave, then this is obviously talking to you. All of you who, that's a strong word, right? Belong. I own you. I own you. Yeah, you do. You own me. So all of us who belong <clears throat> to Christ, this is God's will for your life. This is what he wants. And so he says, be thankful. He's telling you you have to choose something, right? You know, there's lots of things that, that happen uh, as a result of being born again. You know, one day you, you rush the altar and you say, no more, I can't do this on my own. And you're weeping, crying, snots are flying everywhere. I just want to change my life. I need you, right? Those are, that's a great day. And there's a lot of things that happen when you're born again, okay? What you are at that moment is saved. That's awesome, right? And if that was it, <laughs> right? But there's more. Um, you're a child of God. You were a creation, now you're a child of. Um, you get to go to heaven and not go to hell. Awesome, right? You're forgiven. Uh, you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You, and, and that spirit that is now living in you deposits a gift inside of you, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, a spiritual gift, some talent, some ability that's not what everyone has. It's just something unique and, and powerful in you to give you so that you could build his church. That's what the Bible says. So you're indwelled by the Spirit. You're given a gift by the Spirit. You're a child of God. You're saved. You're going to heaven. And you're a member of the body of Christ, right? These are all good things, right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But there's some, there's some things that you're not. What you are is those things. But what you're not is always happy. You're not always generous. You're not always patient. You're not always forgiving. Don't leave me hanging up here. Come on now. I got one friend in the house. You're not always faithful. You're not always humble. You're not always loving, and you're not always thankful. These things must be chosen. They must be chosen. And, and, and it's, not that, it's not that folks like you don't have anything to be thankful for, right? I mean, everybody, even if you're kind of in a low season, a dry season, like, even so, there's, there's something in your life... Like, it's not like there's a shortage of things to be thankful for, right? Amen. We all can look back in the rearview mirror and see some things, some things that were kind of rough, some things that were kind of good, some things that were kind of rough, but then in the end, you're like, hey, hindsight, that was pretty good, you know? The Bible, I love the Bible, and, and, and if I was God and I was going to write a book, it probably wouldn't have been like this. Um, but you know, it's just filled with stuff like, you know, Israel, God's people, <clears throat> and, and that's you guys now, and... And they're just like you and I, you know, they're in, they're in Egypt as slaves, but not chosen slavery, right? Forced, right? And, and it's, it's horrible, and it's brutal, and it's mean, and bad conditions, and no pay, and people are dying and getting whipped. I mean, it's bad, right? And they were there for, what is it, 400 years? Get some perspective for a second. This country... This United States of America, right? This big powerhouse, awesome thing. What's it been going for? About 250? 250. Israel was in Egypt in slavery for 400 years. Right? That's bad, just in case you're wondering. Yeah. Right? Really super bad. But now God shows up, right? And, and, and he, the 10 plagues. Right, all these supernatural miracles start showing up, frogs and fleas and hail, and the Nile turns into blood, and he slays the firstborn of Egypt just to show himself strong to his people to get them out of there, right? 
and they get out of there and, and they're hungry, so he brings them manna from heaven, right? This cotton candy looking stuff that shows up every day when they walk out of their tent. Wow, this is great. Like, well, how did that happen? And then they complain about that. So what does he do? He brings quail, like, yum, man. Like, this is not, this is not popcorn anymore. Like, this is Sonny's showing up here at our tent. And then they're thirsty, so he gives them water out of a rock. And then they have this big battle against the Amalekites, and they win big victory there. Then he opens up the Red Sea so they could walk through it, right? And so things are going good. And, and, and they're loving on God, and they're loving on Moses, and Moses takes them up there to Mount Sinai, and he goes up on the mountain to get the commands for these people from God that they love, that they've watched him do all this kind of stuff on their behalf. They've got tons to be thankful for. And he goes up there to get the commands, and the people are like, yeah, I mean, you know, I like that Moses guy and that God and stuff, but I think they thought they worked for, like God and Moses worked for Domino's Pizza, 30 minutes or less or your money back. You know, like, they didn't, he didn't show up on time, so like, you know... You know, the whole Red Sea thing, and you know that cotton candy stuff? That was good, but we need a new God. Because I don't know where this Moses is, and so this God that is his, it, it's not working for us, so they start complaining. We need a new God. They build a stupid golden calf. That's us. Thankfulness doesn't come easily. And it doesn't come naturally, and let me tell you something, it doesn't come supernaturally either. He ain't going to do it. You have to make a choice. He could have imposed, right? Could, have, could God, I guess he's got the authority and the power of the universe to impose, you will be thankful to him. Like, and he could have maybe done that with his people, but he didn't do that. That's not the way he set things up, right? In his sovereignty, he said, you get to choose, you get to choose, you get to choose. And they chose poorly. And we choose poorly. It has to be chosen. I like this, though. If you look back in the First Thessalonians verse, he says, be thankful in, 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 in all circumstances, in all circumstances. So this, is, this sheds a little light on it for us. Like, okay, got to be thankful, got to be thankful. How do we do this? Um, it's a moment by moment, circumstance by circumstance, situation by situation choice, right? No one is naturally thankful. That's just not who we are. So that's why he says, in all circumstances. So one's coming, one's coming, one's coming, and I make a choice. And, I make a, and it comes, and I make a choice. And it comes, and I make a choice. I'm not good at this, church, but it's true. That's what we have to do. It's, it's, you, it's you never, never leave your guard down, right? Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, right? Every thought, right? So it's not like, okay, I've decided as of today, I'm a thankful person. <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> You're so stupid. Yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah, that's not going to happen, right? It's true. It's not going to happen, right? Because you can make a decision today, but how many people have made New Year's resolutions, right? I'm going to lose weight this year. Still fat. Still. Still. Right? So, so you can't say, oh, I'm going to be a thankful person. No, 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 no. Moment by moment, situation by situation, circumstance by circumstance, I choose, say I choose, yes. to be thankful. Amen. Now, I love this too. Um, Do you ever ask those big questions like, what's God's will for my life? Yes. What's life all about? What am I supposed to do? Why am I here? Yes. Who am I? Where am I? The big questions, right? Paul says in Philippians 1.10, I want you to know what really matters. I want you to know what really matters. And so when it comes to this issue of God's will, I think most of us kind of miss it. I think we kind of miss it. I mean, just think about the things we think about and talk about when it comes to God's will. Um, what should I major in? Who should I marry? Who should I date? Where should I live? What kind of car should I drive? All, all, all these different. What's my ministry? It's a big one, right? These are important decisions for sure. And you know what? Jesus Christ in, in Isaiah 9, 6, he's referred to as wonderful counselor. 
right? So you, you absolutely can and should ask for guidance in all these matters that I've listed and more, right? But here, here's a matter of fact, this, this is what the Bible would say. So clarity, okay? I want you to leave with clarity. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean not in your own understanding, but seek his will in all that you do. In all that you do, right? And, and what's the promise? If you do that, he will show you which path to take. So how many people in here would like to reduce their mistakes? Come on, right? We're all a bunch of buffoons in here, right? Making one bad decision after another, right? And, he said, and the God of the universe said, hey, listen, maybe this whole thing that Paul told you all about praying without ceasing, maybe that's why. Maybe you need to stop don't do any, like, don't be obnoxious. Um, you want to have Burger King or McDonald's? Hold on, let me pray about that. Like, I, I, you can do it without saying it, right? Because they're going to look at you like you're insane. But, but maybe, just maybe, this whole pray without ceasing thing is this. Like, the reason why you keep screwing up is because you haven't asked me. The promise is, is if you seek my will in all that you do, right? That just means McDonald's, too. Right? All, right? Not just all with a star. Well, that doesn't mean, you know, Nissan or Toyota and I can choose. No, 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 no. Maybe, just maybe if you ask, maybe he'll just tell you too, right? Because it, it does say seek my will and all. And if you do, I'll direct your path. Yeah. So let's take him on his word, right? Let's just not be uh, silly Christians who wear bumper stickers and stuff, but let's actually take him on his word and literally do what it says. Don't be hearers, but what? be doers so why don't we just start praying a little bit more and just maybe i'm just throwing this out there maybe you'll reduce your mistakes right the what really matters most is this it's not what college what career what spouse what form of ministry it's not that it's this this is what really matters is that no matter what the situation or the circumstance, be thankful in it. Be thankful with your Nissan. Be thankful with your Toyota. Be thankful with her. Be thankful with him. Whether it's Arkansas or Alaska, what? Be thankful. Whether it's Harvard or Lake Sumter, be thankful, right? Whether you're a doctor or a ditch digger, be thankful. Rich or poor, be thankful, right? That's what, right? That, that's, that, listen. That's God's will for your life. See, we, 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 put, we put all this other weight on God, like about these things that we think are the most important thing. And he's like, no, dude, like it doesn't make any difference if, if you marry her or, 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 or him or you, you drive a truck or an SUV. Like, like you can ask him that stuff because his word says, seek his will and all and I'll tell you. But like that's not the big thing. The overarching will for all who belong to Christ is not to drive a Nissan. The overarching will for all that belong to Christ is that no matter what car you're driving, or if you're not, be thankful. That's his will for your life. So quit searching, searching, searching. What's your will for me? You just found it. It's a, good night, everyone. And that's awesome, right? Awesome. So now I want to I want to spend the rest of our precious time. We don't have a whole lot of time together. Once a week, I want to spend the rest of our time together, like telling, well, just spending two spending time in two sections of scripture, telling the story of of thirteen men. Um, the first twelve men are in Acts chapter five, and you can turn there, and then. We'll spend, briefly, right at the end, we'll spend some time with um, one guy, this guy, this one prophet of God called Habakkuk. I want to talk about him, okay? Now, um, the reason why I want to, the reason why I want to, to spend the rest of our time in just these two sections of scripture right here is this, I, I, I think that when you, when you come to church, and, and you hear the preacher give you like a high watermark, like something to, 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 to get to. And it's like, Ooh, yikes, you know. My mom would say, oy vey. Oy vey. Like, oh. 
And you hear this stuff, right? And it's like, be thankful in, in every circumstance. And of course, like, we all have our own little life that we're in, right? And you got, you know, you, you know yeah, be thankful. I, I work at Publix, man. I mean, ugh, right? And my car broke down, and, I, and, and you don't know my kids, and, and I got no money for rent, and whatever our little story is, I mean, we all got something, right? And so you, you're hearing this coming from up here, and it's like, you need to do this, and it's like really hard. And every week you should hear something hard. Yes. I hope that you're hearing whatever you, wherever you decide to go to church, it'd be something hard, yes. right? Yes. And, and so you hear this stuff, and it's like, man, I kind of want to do it, but I don't know that I can do that. I don't know if I can pull that off, right? I mean, honestly, right? don't we feel that way a lot? Yeah. So I want to I I spend some time with these guys because I think you need permission to do this. What I mean by that, let, let, me, let me explain. Does anyone know what happened on uh, May 6, 1954? It's a big day. Okay. Permission to whip a Bible at him. Um, <laughs> Haley, he's yours now. He's supposed to control him. Like, get him a muzzle. <laughs> nope. No. No. Nope, 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 nope. I love you. May 6, 1954. My birthday. That was your father, and you thought it was my birthday. That's awesome. Um, no. Okay, listen. So, so this guy named Roger Bannister... He broke the world record. He's the first man to ever run a mile in under four minutes. Ever. Right? Yes. Ever. Right? So, so, so I don't know. Listen, people argue about how long the world's been around. And, you know, scientists say 100 zillion billions. And then Christians say 5,000. And I'm not an authority on either one because I don't know. Okay? But I know it's been here a long time. Right? So let's just talk about 1954 for a second. Let's just talk about just that 2,000-year period right there. Like, it's almost 2,000 years, right? So we know that it's, the world's been around longer than that, right? It, it didn't start when Jesus showed up. We, can we all agree there? Yeah. Right? So, so let's just, can, can we just, like, for sake of argument, can we just say that the, that the world's been around for at least three to 4,000 years? Yeah. Right? So in three to 4,000 years, no one has ever run a mile in under four minutes. Like, it may have been dreamed about, but no one's ever done it, ever. And then one day, this guy, Roger Bannister, he runs the mile, and, and, and he beats the four-minute mark by like a quarter of a second. Unbelievable. The, the, the dream becomes a reality all of a sudden, just like that. After 4,000 years, right, someone finally does it. And what's amazing, though, is that it took... 4,000 years, let's say, to do it. But yet, 46 days later, a guy named John Landy broke Bannister's record. You know why? Oh, this could be done. Wow. This could be done. Right? So listen, 4,000 years or something to get to, to do it one time. And since 1950, how many people in this room? Just no laughing. Who, who's been, who, who was... Born before 1954, raise your hand. Okay, awesome, right? Half the people in the room. Okay, so listen, just in that short amount, just in your life, just in your life right now, right? 4,000 years to do it once. Since then, it's been broken 29 times. 29 times it's been reduced. Why? Because Roger Bannister gave them permission and inspiration to know that it could happen. And that's my desire for you here tonight. As we venture into these two sections of Scripture, I want you to see that in awful circumstances, you can still be thankful. It can be done. It can be done. Acts chapter 5, are you there? Okay. Church, listen. Jesus goes around. He's preaching. He's healing, right? Raising people from the dead. And he gets killed on the cross buried rises again church starts they start preaching people are getting saved like crazy right it's awesome here we are in acts chapter 5 these this couple sells some land of theirs 
to, to, to bring to the apostles, the leaders of the church, because they're like, I want to help out with the church growth, right? We're all into that, right? We're all into that. That's why we give our offering. Oh, guess what? We have no offering baskets up here. Awesome. Okay, I guess we're not taking an offering tonight. This box is back there, y'all. So, so listen. Wow, that's awesome planning right there. <laughs> like, what's going on? I'm sure that happens at Osteen's church all the time, every week, right? Okay, so listen. So, 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 so professional here. So um, <laughs> come join us live. It's, it's even better than at home. So um, I don't even know what I was saying. Oh, so they, yeah, so they want to bring their money, right? And, and, and they lie about how much they sold the land for. So they, you know, they sold the land for like 100 grand, and they bring 50 grand. Hey, is this all you sold the land for? Yeah, yeah, that's what I did. God kills them on the spot drops dead first the husband then the wife comes in she's like yeah she didn't know that her husband just died from that same lie right she's like yeah i'm following my husband i'm submitting dumb dead right so these both get killed so right on the heels of all this is going on right so now all of a sudden the 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 the, the apostles they were the they were the disciples Right? They were at his feet. They were learning. Now they're standing and going and speaking. And they're apostles now, same guys. And they're preaching. And so here we are in verse 17, okay? You ready? Are you there? Everyone have an, uh, an eye on God's word? Okay. The high priest, and his, I'm just going to read through all of this, and then we'll pick it apart a little bit. The high priest and his officials who were Sadducees. Sadducees are just an elite group of the religious leaders um, they, knew the, they knew the law. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Okay. They, were they were sad. Yeah, they were sad because they're like, oh, that's it. We die. We're done. That's so sad. Boo-hoo. Um, <laughs> that's a good one. I like that. I do. The high priest and his officials who were sad <laughs> see, were filled with jealousy and sadness. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, that's awesome, and brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. Like, so they're preaching the gospel. Like, if you believe in Jesus, you may die, right? But what? You live, right? They need to hear this. So the angel of the Lord shows up and says, yeah, keep going. Go back. Don't stop. Go teach them this life, this life message. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told and immediately began teaching. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, that's called the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Just think like Congress, okay? It's kind of like the same kind of a thing. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. So they're thinking they're still in there, right? But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside. They're still standing there. Like, it's not like they had gone and come. They're still there. But when we open the gates, there's no one in there. What? Crazy, right? So it says the captain went. So now the captain's mad. Like, he's like, oh, all right, I'm going to get to the bottom of this, right? So the captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles. So they went to the temple. Right? They go to the temple, and they're like, okay, I have to, I have to, oh, no, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed a paragraph. Um, verse 24, when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Like, what in the world, right? So then someone arrives with this startling news. They're wondering where these people are, where these people are. And this guy shows up and says, the men you put in jail, they're actually in the temple teaching. Like, what in the world we got to do with these guys, Right? So the captain goes with his temple guards and arrests the apostles. They go down to the temple, they come down to the church, they arrest them, but without violence. For they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, the Sanhedrin, where the high priest confronted them. Didn't we tell you never again to teach in this man's name? He demand, this is a demand, right? The authorities, the big guy. Instead, you have filled all all Jerusalem with your teaching about him. First of all, awesome, Amen. right? Filled Jerusalem with your teaching. That should be us, okay? T take that one for you, okay? That's for us. Instead, you filled all of Leesburg with this teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death? 
But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. Amen. That is a good place for an amen. amen. You guys all want to give that another try? Amen. Okay, well, I was going to read it first, but okay, that's good. Good work. <laughs> the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor as, at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. But one member, a Pharisee named, and it's so funny, I've looked up this guy in a bunch of different sources, and Christians just fight about it. Like, I've heard his name pronounced 14 different ways. It's ridiculous. So here in our non-denominational church, so a Pharisee named Gammy Gam, who was an ex expert in religious law, you know Gammy Gam, DJ Gammy Gam, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people. So I did some research on him for real, and some people think that he was like the leader of the leaders. Like he was like the big guy. And so that's why he was respected by all people. And when he said, hey, yo, listen, they did. So I don't know, but, you know, I wasn't there, but highly respected. One of the main guys, let's just say this. He stands up and ordered the men to be sent outside the council chamber for a while. So like if you're not the boss, you probably can't do that, right? So we assume that he probably is. Then outside, okay, so he's out there. So then he says to his colleagues, men of Israel, take what you are planning, uh, take care of what you are planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there, there was that fellow Theotis, whatever, Thetis, they, T, who <laughs> pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, and he was, but he was killed, and all his followers went various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. JJ? <laughs> I can pronounce that. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too. And all his followers were scattered. So you see what he's saying here is like, these guys rise up, but the evidence isn't in the guy. The evidence is in the scattering. And these, but, but, but he's like, hey, you all better be careful because they don't seem to be going anywhere. And they're growing, and they're standing by the guy who's dead, right? The guy who died, somehow they're willing to still preach him and stand by him and willing to put their life in the line. So he's like, just saying, like, so he, he goes on. He's like, so my advice is, is leave these men alone. Let them go. If, they're if they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, like if it's not a real thing, it's going to be overthrown, just like all the other ones, right? Just, so, so just don't worry about it. Um, but if it's from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You're not going to be able to stop it. As a matter of fact, he says, you may even find yourself fighting against God. Right. Yeah, that's not going to work, right? You, who's going to lose there? us okay so the others accepted his advice you think okay well then let him go right they called the apostles in and had them flogged then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of jesus and they let them go so let's just talk Eyes up here for a second. Let's just talk about their circumstance because what's the, what's the call of Scripture? Be thankful in every circumstance, all circumstances. Let's talk about their circumstances for a second. So these guys were arrested. Okay, I'm not going to say raise your hand if you've been arrested because you don't need to, like, do that in front of everybody. Well, we, yeah, we know you. It's, yeah, yeah. Doesn't keep anything a secret. We love you. But, like, there's probably others in here that have been arrested, like, being arrested is, it just sucks. I mean, right? It, it's just not good. If you do something wrong and you get arrested, it's still not good. Yeah. Like, nobody likes being arrested, right? But these guys were actually doing what's right. So not only is it awful to get arrested, but 
here you are like, okay, like I, I was this guy and, and I've been told to repent and turn to God and obey him and I'm obeying him and I still got arrested. Yeah. That's not good circumstance. So maybe, maybe they're not only bummed out about that, but maybe they're a little confused. Like, right, maybe I shouldn't have done this, right? Let's just, bring yourself into the story now, right? Maybe we're like that a little bit. Like, I don't know if I should do this or not. Like, I know God says to, but I've tried it. It didn't work out the way I thought. Like, should I or should I not? Maybe I'm a little bit scared to be obedient now because these guys, right, they're like, I did what the angel of the Lord told me to do. And sometimes in the Bible, the angel of the Lord was actually believed to be the Lord, right? A pre-incarnate Christ showing up and saying, do this. And so you're like, Okay, you're the Lord, I'll do it. And you do it, and then you get arrested and whipped. So I don't, I, 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 I don't know, I'm, I'm a little scared, a little gun shy, right? I'm a little gun shy. Maybe I, if, I, if, I, if I do this, I might get arrested again. Or maybe, look, these are the guys that killed Jesus. I just accused them of it. You killed him, hung him on a tree. So they're not, they won't think twice about staking you up, yeah. right? So circumstances, like, not good. In verse 33, what happens? Death sentence. Death sentence. Not like you're having a bad day. Not like you blow out a tire in your car. No, they decided to kill them. And when they decide to kill you, right, they were just there, just minutes before almost, watching them kill, it was days, but watching them kill Jesus. Like, so they know, like, when you decide you're going to kill me, guess what? You're going to kill me. You're not afraid to kill me. Snap your fingers. Have them off of their heads. Stake them up. Right? Done. So they're afraid, I'm sure. And then in verse 40, of course, what happens? Okay, well, finally, this guy comes in. GG, right? He comes in and, and saves my hide, and, and so I don't have to die, but I get flogged. So I don't know exactly what happened that day. Sometimes they get beaten with wooden sticks. So just imagine a broom handle. Bam, bam, like who wants that one? Or sometimes they use a whip. Nobody likes that. And sometimes they use a whip with all the little strings with little rocks and bone in it, right? Cat of nine tails. Rip, rip the flesh off you. Like that could have been that, right? They got flogged. And then on top of that, don't do it again. Don't do it again. So torn. Don't do it again or that Angel of the Lord saying, do it again. Right? I think most of us would definitely say this is a bad day. Yeah. It's definitely a bad day. So if you want to talk circumstances, these are about as bad as you can get. Would you agree? Now, now this is the part where the preacher would normally compare their circumstances to yours and tell you to suck it up like you don't have it that bad. Right? Yeah. Is that, I mean, we could do that. But I just think it would be better if we just picked on... Me, instead. Um, so I'm kind of a, I'm a Bible nerd. It's just, I, you know, I, like, I love reading the Bible. And I try desperately, except on, except on my day off, I try, to, I try to get two to three hours in the Bible. Like, that's what I think that I want. That's what I think that I need. That's what I think you need from me. I think that's what God wants. So I try to do two to three hours of, of just me and my Bible every single day, but oftentimes, you know, I get interrupted. And it could be a lot of different things. It could be something that has to be done here, a phone call, someone comes in to visit, someone doesn't show up at the coffee house, we got a, a set design to build, we got to get some slides in there, the bills need to get paid, you know, what, what, whatever, you know, someone, the, the, the package, I got to order some supplies. All kinds of stuff, you know, there's just things. And so you get interrupted, and so, you know, I go off grumbling and complaining, and my plan got invaded, and I'm like a kid who, you know, whose cookie got stolen. Meh, 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 right? And in that moment, like, thankfulness is over in, like, China somewhere, right? Like, it's not even anywhere in this hemisphere, yeah. right? Am I unique? No, no, yeah. not, 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 not at all, right? Not at all. So, so what about the, the 12 guys here? Yeah. Right? They have a reason to complain? They got a reason to complain, right? 
Oh, you, I wanted to read my Bible in my cushy little office over there, my leather chair, my air conditioning, and you wanted to talk to me. And these guys, right, they get flogged for being obedient to God. Right? And arrested. Public shame. But what did they choose to do? Well, go back to the text. It says that the others accepted the advice of Gigi. And they called in the apostles, had them flogged, and then ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let him go. The apostles left the high council. Like, listen, it wasn't the next day. It wasn't after their, heal, their wounds healed. They just got whipped or beaten with a broomstick. And as they're leaving, they were rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And then every day, they went back at it. Life on the line, whip me, beat me, or kill me, I'm going to do it. Woohoo! Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> they were re look, they were rejoicing. Thank you, God, for whipping me. Thank you, God, for the public discredit. It's, it's not a mistake that it said that they put him in the public jail. They didn't put them in some, they didn't ship them off down a little alley somewhere where nobody could know where they are down here. Where you could hide and, and there's no shame. They put them where everybody could see them. Because that's what, that's what would happen back in these days, like in Rome. They put prisoners out there where you could see them and they torture them and whip them. So it's like, you want this to happen to you? This is what happens to people who, who buck the system. Public shame, disgrace. And these guys are like, thank you, God, for doing that for me. I can't believe you'd allow me the privilege of the abuse and the disgrace and arrested. Why did they choose to be thankful? Why were they thanking God? Yay! Why were they doing this? I'll tell you why. Because like what Paul said, they understood what really matters. And it's not comfort or my rights or my freedoms or my fun or my family or my money or my work it was the privilege of being used by God to advance his church that's what matters most and that's why they chose to be thankful a shift in the thinking of the church is needed we need a spiritual revolution that's what we need we need people to think differently. Get out of this little, this little Americanized Christianity and get back to what it really means to be a Christ follower. What does this do to the prosperity gospel that says God's here to give you everything? He's like, no, I want you to be my slave. And if you need to get whipped and beaten and killed, rejoice. That's real Christianity. Look at all the, look at Jesus himself. Look at all of his apostles and disciples. What they, they got murdered and arrested and whipped and beaten. They didn't, he said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Yeah. So much for a prosperity gospel. Yeah. Did a little research in prosperity gospel last night with my wife. Yes. Do you know that in all of Scripture, in, oh, I'm sorry, in all of the New Testament, there's only one, one, one reference of prosperity that has anything to do with money in the entire New Testament. One. I think there's, there's four times in all of the New Testament that prosperity or any form of it, prosper, prosperity, prospereth, four times it's used. And only one pertains to money. He said, I, I, I pray, King James, I believe, says, I wish that your that you would prosper and be healthy even as your soul prospereth. That's the only time in the entire New Testament that it talks about prosperity when it comes to money. And that's not even, I'm not even quite sure that's money, but it could be. The other ones have nothing to do with it. It means success in a journey. That's what it means. Okay. This is real Christianity. Suffering. I count it joy to suffer for you. 
I can't believe you, you'd count me worthy to be whipped and beaten and put in jail for you to advance your purposes. What a privilege it is. So, um, I believe that the key to being thankful um, is this. We're choosing things, right? I choose to focus on what really matters. That's my choice. I, I, in my every day, all my circumstances, where I go, what I do, I choose of my own will to focus on what really matters most. That's what Paul said. I want you to know what really matters. And this is how bad stuff, right, bad stuff that happens kind of turns into good stuff. How, this, is how, this is how getting put in jail and, 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 and beaten almost to death and threatened, I'll do it again if you do this again. This is how that turns into good, right? Amen. Whipped. Bad, right? It is. It's bad. Bad. But yet somehow experienced and viewed as good, right? Public disgrace. That's bad, right? It is. It's bad. But somehow, some way experienced and viewed as good. Only Christians can pull this off, right? Nobody else could do this. They think we're crazy, because we are. We're peculiar people. Ordered, listen, how about this one? In, in our country, we're always complaining that, that we're, we're being persecuted and not going to be able to share our faith and, and, and all this persecution. We need to do something about it. Listen, 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 listen. They said that they counted it a joy to be told not to do it. They were told, do not preach in Jesus' name or this is what you get. And they said, thank you. Thank you for the persecution. This is how, I mean, it's, if someone tells you don't share your faith, that's bad, right? I get that. But yet somehow experienced and viewed as good. These guys were, were doing what God wanted them to do and then look at the results. Bad, bad. Bad things happen when they did good things. Could that have gotten them down or discouraged or maybe doubting that they should do this anymore or if they've made the right decision? For sure, right? But it's clearly not the case, is it? So I want to just say this as your pastor who loves you. I would just say beware of the Christian that tells you that you'll Know that you're doing God's will when everything's flowing seamlessly. Because that's what everyone always says. I hear it all the time. You know, it just has to be God's will because everything just fell right into place. Yeah. Beware. Beware. Let me tell you who gives you everything you want. Satan. God gives you everything you need. And so when things are not going so well, look at these guys. They were doing what God wanted and they got put in jail, and beaten. <clears throat> Maybe in our little made-up, hybrid, christian e American thing, version that we conjure up, maybe things go smoothly when you're following Christ. It's got to be because... He's in it because it's just fallen into place. <clears throat> Where we see God at work is not always in the removal of hard circumstances and suffering, but in the thankful heart of the Christian that's going through it. One of the greatest displays of this was, and I've shared this with you before, but I, it's worth mentioning, my buddy Pat from years ago. He's in my old brown Bible that I still have, my first Bible that fell apart. But I won't throw that away, not only because I love the Bible, but I love to see his picture. And at 46 years old, he's got the, the bag. He can't pee, he can't poop, he can't enjoy his wife. You know, all this done, cancer-filled, dead, 46 years old but so thankful for the life that he gave, talked about it all the time, loved Jesus, told his nurses while he was dying the last couple days, his last breath he was sharing the gospel with people, like so amazingly 
awful, and that was the power of God. Like, would it have been awesome if God had said, be healed? No doubt. I would love to have him here. Like, I miss Pat. He's been gone, like, since 2005 or something. I still have his number in my phone. I, won't, I just won't erase it. I would love this man, you know? Same thing with Mr. Greg. His number's never leaving my phone. I love the guy. Did I want him to be healed of cancer? Yeah. Did we all? Yeah. Who cares? He didn't care. Because, because he died with such a thankful heart, his testimony is encouraging you right now to believe, you know what, I can be thankful in all circumstances. Because he was going to die, and he was still thankful. He still rejoiced in God. He loved the Lord. Greg, how are you? I'm truly blessed and highly favored. You know what I mean? Tubes in him, ventilator, IVs, dead in a day and a half. How are you? Truly blessed and highly favored. Like that is, that's the power of God. That's where we see God working, right? And doesn't, doesn't their thankful heart and the, the, these apostles, their thankful attitude and their thankful heart, doesn't it just inspire you to do the same? And you just hear that? It's kind of like the Roger Bannister thing, right? Like, my circle, I'm not going to talk about your circumstance, but they could be bad, but, like, look at theirs. Like, I, preacher, I, you're saying to be thankful in all circumstances. I understand what it says, but, but I got this. You don't have this. And they were thankful anyway. So it's kind of like Roger Bannister. Don't you know now that it's possible? They weren't any different than you. They were just fishermen and tax collectors, the scum. The, the, the blue-collar nobodies of their day, and yet somehow, some way, after being arrested and beaten, thank you, God, yeah. right? Crazy, but doesn't it inspire you? Like, doesn't it make you feel, doesn't it, don't you feel like you just got a permission slip? I can do this. Yeah. I can do this, right? You should say it. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this, I can do this too. I can do this. So I choose Jesus means you always have something to be thankful for. All the time. Do me a favor. We're done with the 12. Let's go to the 1. Let's just go to the book of Habakkuk. You might not even know it's in the Bible, but it's there. It's one of the little itty-bitty books at the very end. I think I have it up on the screen, the page. So if you don't, you know, you should get a Bible here. And uh, take a look at this thing. I'll give you a second to get there. Pages are probably stuck together. So let's just give you a little more inspiration, a little more permission to be thankful in all circumstances. Let's let you be like Roger Bannister or that John Landry guy. Hey, I can do this. I can do this. And, and because you did it, now I can do it. 29 men have found a way to somehow break this record because now, hey, this is possible. This is possible. So if you look at the beginning of the book of Habakkuk, and I'm going to read the first, like, four verses, and you're going, to see, you're going to start seeing, hey, you know what? Goodness, this sounds like us. Man, this sounds like I could have been writing this. Watch this. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Raise your hand. Let me ask you, how many, how many people in this room have been praying for something for more than five years? Raise your hand. And it hasn't happened yet, right? So you feel, is he feeling you? Are you feeling him? Yeah. We're tracking with old Habakkuk, right? Yeah. Violence is everywhere, but you do not see, come to save. Aren't you, aren't you like that? Like, come on, God. Come down here and smite them. They're rotten. Get those guys, right? They're, they're killing babies. They're warring. They're selling drugs to our kids. <coughs> Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Sounds like America, doesn't it? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight, Facebook. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. Can you relate? Okay. Now, go to the very, that's the very beginning of his letter. 
his grievance. And at the very end of the letter, watch how he finishes it up. This is an agricultural society back then. Now it's not like that. We're not farmers and stuff like that. We buy stuff on Amazon and Walmart and car dealerships and movie theaters and all that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit different, but you'll be able to pick it up. The overall picture in the nation is bad, he just told us. And we're all like that too. But now he gets really personal. He says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So that's very, very personal. Things are rotten in the nation. Things are rotten for him personally. No prosperity at all in anything. Everything's a bust in his life. Horrible. But let me just tell you this, loved ones. What you have in Christ should begin to surpass all worldly gain, all financial gain. All, all comfort, it should, it should transcend current events, chapter 1. It should transcend and surpass all professional advancement or fulfillment in your job or your money or where you live. And so therefore, when all these things that we hold up as so important begin to dwindle, the Christ follower can still rejoice and still be thankful. Because no matter what the issue no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the problem, no matter what the lost, I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. Jesus loves me so much that he died for me to pay for my sin, to buy my freedom. He is right now, loved ones, preparing a place for you. And at just the right time, when all things are ready, he will return to take you home to be with him forever. Amen. Amen. One clapper. One clapper. One clapper, right? We have something to rejoice about. Something to rejoice about. Look what he says. He says, all these things are terrible. We're, cl- we're done now. We're done. You ready? All these things are terrible. Yet, I'll be joyful in the God of what? Of my salvation of my salvation. He's like, listen, the nation's a mess. The courtroom is is perverted. There's no justice. Everyone's lying and cheating and complaining and fighting. It's there's there's riots in the street, setting fire to cities and and nothing's good. As a matter of fact, my farm is failing. So my resources are down. My identity is shot. Everything is bad. My whole world's caving in, but yet I'm saved. So I can still rejoice. I can still be thankful that there's a God who came down from heaven seeking to save me. Amen? So you always have reason to be thankful. Awesome. Listen, we have a reason to be thankful. We have a big reason to be thankful. When all other things fail, when we're persecuted for our faith, when people hate you for loving Jesus, when you get whipped and beaten, persecuted, when there's no, there's no grapes on the vine, my cupboard's empty, my checkbook's empty, Job's horrible. The air conditioning in my car failed. Having a hard time paying my rent. I can still be. I can. Re, I can still be thankful. I can still rejoice in the God of my salvation. another step loved ones not just rejoicing in the salvation but he said to rejoice in the God 
of my salvation. It's not that you get to be in heaven that you should rejoice about. It's that you get to be in heaven with Jesus that you get to be thankful about. That's what we're thankful for, to be with Jesus. I don't care if he was hanging out in Detroit, that would rock, right? Just to be with Jesus. And one day, one day, on that glorious day, whether you, whether it's tomorrow or, or 500 years from now when he comes back and gathers us all up and we get to be with him forever, one day, vast crowd, and all of a sudden, Nobody can t kick you out. No one can take your spot in line. There's no more pain. There's no more tears. There's no more sorrow. There's no more sickness. There's no more death. There's no bad memories. There's no, hey, where's that guy that I loved and wanted to be here? Gone. All eyes on Christ. Get your eyes on Jesus. Keep them there. And listen, loved ones. If you really belong to him, do loss. If you're really his slave, then there's only one choice you can make in this. Choose to be thankful in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for all who belong slave to Christ Jesus. So I choose to be thankful. So we don't have baskets. Don't matter. Take a few moments. This is what an offering is. An offering is not an obligation. An offering isn't, hey, here's the budget of the church. We need to meet it. No, that's not the offering. An offering is a free will. It's, it's an offer. It's like, God, I want to give you this. We're talking about thankful, right? So, so before you put in what you thought you were supposed to or your 10% or whatever, blow that thing out of the water, right? Pray. Take a few moments and pray. And, and figure out what, 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 what it looks like to be, like you said earlier, we don't know, we're, not always we're not always generous, are we? What does it look like to be generous? What does it look like to be thankful? And, and that's what you should give. That's what you should give. So we're going to just keep the room just like this for a few moments. Pray. I'm going to shut up. You pray. And whatever he leads you to do, take that. And, and the boxes are right there on the wall. Just, just go back there and, and put it in one of the boxes. Or if you don't want to, just, just leave it up here on the corner of the stage, I guess. We'll collect it don't matter. We'll figure it out. So just take a few moments and pray and then give according to your thanksgiving.